turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 19. The name of today's message is Thor versus Jesus. Thor versus Jesus. We worship an awesome God. Let's look at who's in one corner weighing in at Thor versus Jesus. Look at Jesus. Revelation 19, 11 through 16. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. This is Jesus Christ. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with an iron, a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty, and on his robe and on his thigh was, has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. You know, when we were kids, and maybe this is true of boys uh, more than little girls, I don't know, but when you're kids, you always, uh, you always argue whose dad could beat up somebody else's dad. And uh, girls, I don't know, did you do that? Uh, and, and you're always uh, arguing about which superhero would be stronger. Remember, you're always saying the thing, which is the orange guy from Fantastic Four, versus the Hulk, which is the big green guy. So the orange guy versus the green guy, who's going to win? Or, or Spider-Man versus Hawkman, or Aquaman versus Namor. And when I pull out Namor, you know I'm really going deep into the geek world there. Uh, Superman versus anybody. Uh, Superman, obviously. Today, it's going to be Thor versus Jesus. And I want you to bear with me. Bear with me. There's really and actually a very good reason that we're doing Thor versus Jesus today. Uh, last year in March, there was a, a conference of uh, atheists that met in Washington, D.C., and their purpose was to uh, show the United States that atheism can be, they can be good and friendly and kind people uh, to change the perception of atheism. It was billed as a family event, which shocked some of the families when they started leading the people in the F word against the church. Uh, big rally. Uh, Bill Maher got up there and uh, sneeringly, condescendingly said, uh, don't compare your reason with my reason. He's talking about Christians. Uh, your reason belongs with Zeus and Thor and the Kraken on that shelf over there. And so what is he saying? You believe in Jesus? <laughs> well, some people believe in Thor. It's the same. Uh, big, big whoop. Uh, there's a, a poem written by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow called The Challenge of Thor. And I, I skipped some of it. I thought it was fun, but I, I skipped some of it just to give you the first and the beginning and the end. He says, I am the god Thor. I am the war god. I am the thunderer. Here in my north land, my fastness and fortress, reign I forever. Here amid icebergs, rule I the nations. Here is my hammer. Uh, Mjolnir, the mighty, giants and sorcerers cannot withstand it. Force rules the world still, has ruled it, shall rule it. Meekness is weakness, strength is triumphant. Over the whole earth still it is Thor's day. Thou art a god too, O Galilean, and thus single-handed unto the combat, gauntlet or gospel, here I defy thee. So there's this idea of, of might makes right, the, the mythological war hero, he, he rule by... by or it's the gospel, Jesus Christ, God incarnate, who came down and he, he gave up his life and, he, and he, he bled for our sins. And there's this idea that there's two different ways of looking at the world going on. And the challenge in Longfellow's poem uh, still echoes today. Comically, I've seen Thor t-shirts that say, might makes right. It, wouldn't that be a beautiful world? Might makes right. You can take every, anything you want as long as you can beat up somebody. Who's to say it's wrong? What, what does right and wrong mean anyways? There's, there's no God to say this is, 
this is good, this is wicked, it's just opinion, and I'm bigger than you, and my opinion is I can take what I want. Might makes right. Or I even saw comically a Thor t-shirt that said WWTD. What would Thor do? Well, he'd kick somebody's butt. <laughs> that's, what, that's the way Thor deals with problems. He picks up a hammer and he hits things. Uh, a more serious charge, though, again, is made by those who reject Christ and who say that Jesus is no different than Thor or an invisible dragon. I mean, you, you're praying. Who are you praying to? Well, I'm praying to God. Oh, yeah? He's your imaginary friend. Why don't you just pray to some invisible dragon? There's just as much proof for Thor as there is in Christ. And, and Richard Dawkins, uh, an atheist, kind of championed this idea when he said, don't engage Christians in a logical argument. Don't use reason with Christians. Instead, just mock them. Uh, heap derision and abuse on Christians. Don't play their game. Don't try and argue with Christians. Which, of course, is, is the very example of begging the question. Just assume you're right and, and say that, in like, like uh, many atheists have, that believing in Jesus is just like believing in any other, uh, you know, in, in an imaginary friend of some sort. So we've been talking about this over the course of the, because we're about to transition into the New Testament, not next week, but probably a week after. And so I've been laying down the groundwork over this last month, why we should believe in God. Because, boy, I'll tell you, we're going to get into the New Testament. It's beautiful. It's amazing. God is real. God sees your situation. He sees your hurt and pain, your the, the trouble in relationships, the fear we have for the future, are, he sees that, that all humanity lives under the shadow of death. God sees it all, and God sees us in the real world, and he really cares about us. He loves us so much he can't. So this is huge. I mean, if the things of the New Testament are true, it really does change everything, and our lives should orient ourselves around Jesus Christ. But if it's just plain make-believe, I don't want to be here. And... and uh, I think we'd all rather be, be home doing basically anything else rather than being here if uh, Christianity is a myth, if it's not true. So we, we looked at the scriptures and saw how rock solid they are and, and how we know that the things that are written in here are what the first generation of Christians actually believe. The people who walked with Christ believe this stuff. We, we saw that. And we, we looked at what the Christmas message is all about and how impactful it is and what that means so uh, today we're going to look at some reasons to believe that uh, Jesus can kick Thor's butt because Jesus is real and Thor isn't. Uh, if this is true, it's life-changing. Boy, more than life-changing, it'll change your eternal destiny, heaven or hell. Everything depends on, on uh, whether Jesus Christ is real God and really came and died for our sins. But atheists... And others who reject Christ will often again say that belief in Jesus is uh, like believing in polka dot dragons. I mean, you can believe whatever you want. So this morning, we're going to put that to the test. Now, in this matchup, I could have chosen Osiris or, or Shiva or Quetzalcoatl or uh, you know, the FSM. The FSM is Flying Spaghetti Monster or a Purple Unicorn. But because the Avengers movie was made a lot of money and it was really cool and I like Thor and he's really cool and I like the way he hits things with hammers, uh, I decided to go with Thor. So it's Jesus versus Thor this morning. So we're going to compare uh, Thor to Jesus uh, and as we uh, look at this, we're gonna, a second thing we're going to do is look at Christianity. Let me challenge you with this. Christianity is either... From God, it's a divine miracle. Or your only other reasonable option, number two, it's a mind-blowing secular miracle. And what I mean by secular miracle is that there's just rational explanations for everything. It's really not from God, but it defies all odds. Christianity defies all odds the way it just sprung on the world, spread across the world, and we're going to look at it's either a secular miracle or a divine miracle, those are your two choices. Either way, uh, totally, you could not have predicted uh, the outcome. Okay. Ding, ding. Round one. Worshippers. 
as I just said, Christianity has spread from a handful of believers. Jesus Christ had just a handful of believers uh, when he died upon the cross. A handful of believers at Christ's death and it spread across the entire globe like no other movement in the history of the world. From jungles in Peru to Papua New Guinea to the Ural Mountains to the Himalayas, from France to Mexico to South Korea, you will find followers of Jesus Christ. You'll, you'll come in uh, to places that you think are remote and isolated and you'll find a church there. Wherever you go this morning, Sunday morning, people all over the world are bending their knee and worshiping Jesus Christ. Thor, not so much. You're going to find Christ's followers come from the poor and the rich, the uneducated, and the brilliant. If Thor was real and was mighty God, you'd, accept, you'd expect something very similar. But no. However, let's be honest here. Popularity is not a measure of truth. Millions of people have been wrong before, very often. So, round two. You might expect the scriptures about Thor or Jesus to impact people's lives. Thor is written about in some epic poetry, written long after the Viking culture had quit its marauding ways. So Thor, it's called the Eddic Poems. Thor is written about in these, in these epic poems where he does battle with, these, with the giant Midgard serpent and all these things. And these poems were written, guess when? Long after the Viking people had stopped marauding and converted to Christianity. Jesus was written about extensively by the people who knew him. And the entire Bible was probably finished before AD, uh, 100 AD. In other words, during the lifespans of the people that knew him. Are you starting to see that it's kind of ridiculous to compare uh, the Kraken and Zeus and Thor to Jesus? Kind of ridiculous. It was, the New Testament was finished by the people that knew Christ in his generation. Further, the Bible has changed the course of people's lives all over the entire world. We've talked about this before, the recidivism rate of prisoners. People that go to jail almost always will go to jail again. People that go to jail and give their heart to Jesus Christ get involved in a Bible study, come out and join a church, they hardly ever go back to jail again. Something real is going on. In other words, this message, this truth here, impacts people's lives. We've talked about the divorce rate is about 50% in the United States. The divorce rate among people who are really dedicating their lives to Jesus Christ, living in the, uh, for Christ, you know, part of not only church but Bible studies and praying together, is, is minuscule compared to that. In our movement, it's about 2%. Huge difference when we apply the Word of God to our lives. Think about the, this I want for a second. This book. Well, David was a shepherd. Written by uh, mostly shepherds. Big bulk of the Old Testament. Written by mostly fishermen. Most of the New Testament. Written by shepherds and fishermen. We think Israel's a big deal because we're Christians. Guess what? The Jewish people, minor tribe on the edge of the Mediterranean. And somehow, a bunch of shepherds and fishermen wrote this thousands of years ago. And it's captured the hearts and minds of people all over the world. Now, why is that? How is that? Does Thor have anything to compare to that? Obviously, obviously no. Criminals have repented and gone straight. Liars have learned to speak the truth. Addicts have traded in their addictions for the love of God. Marriages have been saved. Men and women have totally, totally, their life is going in one direction. They've met Jesus Christ in the scriptures and life. Their lives took a totally different direction, total reorientation. This is either because, A, this book is from God, or B, because of nothing supernatural, somehow this book beat all the odds and connected with the psyche of people all across the world in generation after generation. It's either a miracle from heaven or it's a secular miracle. You tell me. Any other people group on the planet, small tribe. Most of the tribes that were around when the Jews were around are gone. They're all gone. Even big empires like the Hittites, they're gone from history. 
And somehow, the Jewish people created a book that, like we said, goes into Peru and Papua New Guinea, into Europe, into the corners of Asia, all over the Americas, Polynesia. And wherever it goes, people are impacted. And I've seen people from so many different countries reading scriptures and, and with tears in their eyes because of the way it speaks to their soul. This God, God revealed himself to us and there's nothing else like it in the history of the world. Not even close. Thor loses this round as well. I kind of combined two rounds there. So now we're in round four, miracles. All I'm going to say about miracles is that uh, millions of people millions of people in generation after generation and people group after people group uh, believe that God works miraculously in their lives. I could spend the whole time today just sharing stories from my own life. Now maybe a neutral observer would say, you know, I don't, I'm not prepared to believe in uh, miracles yet. And that's to be expected from a neutral person. You don't have to believe in miracles. I'm not forcing you to believe in miracles. The point here is though that people who follow Jesus Christ believe that God's real, that he listens to their prayers, that he responds, and that God works miraculously in our lives. By comparison, Thor does not have a significant following of people who would believe the same thing today. So if you're keeping score, Jesus 4, Thor 0. Round 5. Prophecy. Let's go to the Old Testament. I want us to go to Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53. So, so far, Jesus 4, Thor 0. Ha, is it fair? Ha, was it fair when atheists, uh, when Bill Maher said, your reason can't compare to my reason. Take your reason off my shelf. Your re reason belongs on the shelf with Zeus, Thor, and the Kraken. Is that Kraken? Is that making any sense so far that the two are comparable in any way, that those two groups are comparable in any way? Let's look at Isaiah chapter 53. written over 700 years before the time of Christ. 700 years. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing is in appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others. A man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him as punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before the shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Yet, uh, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And, through the Lord, and, and though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death. He was numbered with the transgressors, transgressors, for he bore the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Well, I posted this uh, in a group online of uh, uh, atheists and, and in another group with uh, some uh, Muslim friends. And I challenged them. I said, this is written... Uh, by prophet, it's a prophecy. Who does this remind you of? 
I didn't tell him, this is Jesus. Well, it's obviously Jesus. I didn't tell him, this is Jesus. I said, who does this remind you of? And people were dodging and dodging. I kept saying, well, just tell me who it reminds you of. Can't you even answer that? Nobody wanted to answer that question. I finally said, come on, just give me a straight answer. Who does it look like to you? And one atheist said, okay, fine. It looks like Jesus Christ. But maybe that's because I just grew up in America and I'm conditioned to think this is Jesus. I said, okay, maybe. That's possible. And then I said, well, several billion people have existed in the history of the world. Name me one that looks like this other than Jesus. Nobody answered. I, I posted it with the Muslims, too, because Muslims believe Jesus is a prophet. They don't believe uh, he's the son of God. He don't, they don't believe he died for our sins. Uh, that he rose again, like Isaiah 53 clearly prophesies, again, 700 years before Christ. So I asked him, who does this remind you of? Didn't want to answer. Who does this remind you of? Didn't want to answer. Who does this remind you of? Didn't want to answer. I said, come on, just give me an answer. And again, okay, fine, it looks like Jesus, but that's because obviously this was written after his time. I said, no, sorry. Now, most Muslims would have known better, but this particular Muslim didn't know the chronology of Scripture there. So that was at least a very honest answer. It looks like Jesus because obviously it was written after Jesus. No, it was written 700 years before Jesus. And you, by the way, you are right. You read that and you say, boy, that looks like Jesus. And nobody else out of all the billions of people that have ever lived. So we're looking at prophecy and we have something Incredible going on in this scriptures that we don't have going on anywhere else. Again, written about 750 years before the crucifixion. The church father, Jerome, wrote of the prophet Isaiah. He said, Isaiah was more of an evangelist than a prophet because he described all of the mysteries of the church of Christ so vividly that you would assume he was not prophesying about the future, but rather composing a history of past events. Yes, that's why sometimes we call the book of Isaiah uh, a, a gospel, like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Isaiah, because it so clearly talks about Jesus Christ. There are some other amazing prophecies in the Bible, and I could spend the whole day on prophecy, just the way I could spend the whole day sharing miracles that God has done personally, subjectively in my life. But I just decided to take a few of them. One of them, one prophecy is about Abraham. Abraham, this man who lived so long ago in Genesis 12, 18, and, and also Genesis chapter 22, God tells the prophet, he says, through you, every nation on earth is going to be blessed. This is an incredible prophecy. You go back several thousands of years, and there's all these different families all over the globe. There's some, there's some you know, Eskimos, and there's some people in the Congo, and there's there's the forerunners of, of, of European civilization. There are people all over, and you could choose any one family. Listen. Choose one family on the planet and say, through your descendants, the entire world is going to be blessed. And the odds of you, well, in fact, if you chose anybody other than Abraham, you would have been wrong. Abraham was the only right answer at that time. Today, there are some 6,909 spoken languages in the world. 6,909, and in 12 years, it's estimated the Bible, or at least significant portions of it, will be translated into every language that's still used on the planet. You know, there's not another book that even comes close. Nothing like it. Also, in our lifetimes, in, I remember when it happened. In our lifetimes, it's become true that there's at least one church, and in many more than that, not by now, in every country on the planet. There's no other religion, like there's nothing else even remotely close to that uh, that's ever existed in the history of the world. So God takes this prophecy and said, Abraham, through your descendants, the entire world's going to be blessed, and here comes Christianity, a result right through this line of David, right through the line of Abraham, through David to Jesus Christ. His message went out and has changed the world unlike anything else. There's not, any, there's not any political theory. There's not any economic theory. There is nothing like Christianity that has altered the world like this. And you could have taken any family, you could have taken the Mayans or, or some Celts or any, anyone, and you would have been wrong. 
But the Bible prophesied that through Abraham, the world would be changed. And wow, even if you don't believe in God, you've got to say, wow, that's, <laughs> that kind of freaks me out a little bit. How in the world? Again, this is either a divine miracle or a secular miracle, and you only have two choices. No other religion, including Thor's, no other human philosophy or teaching is like it. So take any other ancient person, Abraham, roughly 4,000 years ago. When Abraham was on the planet, you know there were still mammoths walking the earth? Well, uh, it was a small island off the close coast of Siberia called Wrangel Island, where the last remnants of the mammoths were still alive at that time. So Abraham, he's an, he's an old guy. But uh, maybe you don't really believe that Moses was the primary author of the Pentateuch. So you're not going to say 4,000 years ago. You're not going to take Moses at that time. So you're going to, a lot of people who don't believe that Moses wrote the, old, or the Pentateuch will say, well, the Genesis probably came when the Jews were living in Persia. Okay, fine. Your odds are still not much better. Let's take the year 400 uh, B.C. when the Jews were in Persia. I'll still let you choose any family on the planet. Choose any family on the any tribe from China or India or, or uh, from the Mayans or the Gauls and make a prediction that their family would impact the world to the decree that the descendants of Abraham have. And again, you would be wrong. Thor has nothing like this. Another prophecy, Israel. The, the Jewish people. The Jewish people themselves are an amazing testimony to the reality and the dependability of this book. In Jeremiah chapter 9, listen to this, God prophesied that the Jews would be scattered among the nations. Did you know that no people group? The Nigerians have told me, Nigerians, we are great travelers. We go across the world. That's true. The Nigerians don't compare to the Jewish people. No, God says... I'm going to scatter the Jewish people among the nations, and no people group have been more widely distributed than the Jews. <laughs> Amazing coincidence. It's either because God said it and God did it, or it's just another one of those, wow, that's, again, that's pretty freaky. A bunch of, bunch of shepherds and fishermen wrote this, and, well, it's a secular miracle. It defies the odds. Even more amazing in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 28, God even tells the Jews that their exile, he said, God's telling the Jews, this is what your exile among the nations can look like. When God told them that, they didn't even have a nation yet. They were a wandering group. And God says, you're going to come to your country, you're going to disobey me, and I'm going to scatter you among the nations. He said, this is going to be the tenor. This is what your exile is going to look like. Listen to this. And tell me, you've heard of the, po the pogroms in Russia? You heard about how uh, England drove out all the Jews, how, how Spain, after they freed themselves from uh, Islamic rule, drove out the Jews, the Inquisition. You've heard about the Holocaust. Listen to this. God tells the Jews, before they even have a country, that he would scatter them among the peoples. Listen, the Lord will scatter you among the peoples from one end of the earth to the other. And again, there's no people group that looks like this except for the Jewish people. The Lord will scatter you among all peoples from one end of the earth to the other, and among these nations you will find no ease. And there shall be no rest for the sole of your foot. Night and day you shall be in dread and have no assurance for your life. You shall become an astonishment, a proverb, a byword among the nations where the Lord will drive you. God foretold that they would be scattered and returned and scattered and returned again. And they, they first returned from Persia in 537 B.C. Amazing. Uh, think about the different countries. I, I, I love studying history. There are whole languages that are gone. There are whole tribes. There are major empires. The Lydian Empire, the Hittite Empire. There are major empires that are the Olmecs, totally erased from history. Their, their, their descendants are gone. And yet this one tribe, God said, you're going to be scattered and brought back, scattered and brought back. And guess what? 
they, their country was defeated, they were scattered, and they came back. And then they were scattered again, and in 1948, they came back. Tell me another people group that have lost their country, come back, lost their country, come back, like the Jewish people. Well, it's just coincidence. Yeah, they're kind of adding up, aren't they? <laughs> kind of adding up. We find this fulfillment of, of, of verses in a place like Ezekiel eleven sixteen 16 through 17. says, Therefore, uh, says the Lord God, though I had removed them far away among the nations, and though I had scattered them among the countries, yet I was a sanctuary for them a little while in the countries where they had gone. Therefore, therefore say, Thus saith the Lord God, I will gather you from the peoples and assemble you out of the countries among which you have been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel. That is amazing. There are many, many prophecies we could look at, uh, but again, I don't want to take the whole time on prophecy today. Uh, the last one we're going to look at would be verses in Daniel and Revelation. Beautiful verses in the Old Testament and the New Testament that speak of God's people. God's people. Now, when Daniel was written, most of the people who believed in God were Jewish. They, th you know, other people looked at God as a Jewish tribal religion. Most of the believers of God were Jewish. At the time of Revelation, Christians were, were a small, tiny, persecuted minority. And yet, these prophecies in Daniel and Revelation say God's people will come from every tribe and every nation. We look back from 2013 and say, oh yeah, there's Christians everywhere. Everywhere you go, there's Christians. I want you to think, when Daniel wrote that, the Jewish people were scattered. They were held in captivity. And he says, people, he's a prophet. And he's saying, people from every single culture and country and language are going to come and worship God. And then, and then fast forward. Fast forward to, to when John is writing the book of Revelation. He sees this glimpse of heaven. He says, I looked around. There were people from every culture and every language and every people group there. Bold prophecy. That's a bold prophecy. If, if many religions, many, many religions, uh, the Romans had a ton of mystery religions like the, the cult of Mithras. Many religions have just gone out of history. They're gone. Or you just stay small and you dwindle and dwindle, hanging on. And there's big prophecies all throughout the Bible, throughout the entire Bible, it says, this is for all people. This is a message for all people. Jesus Christ died for the sins of who? The entire world. And these prophecies that Christians would come from every language group have come true. This is stunning. Jesus 5, door 0. Round 6, ding, ding. Impact. I'm going to make this one fast and clear. The followers of Thor raped and pillaged their way across the known world and killed many Christians, including unarmed monks and missionaries, until they were peacefully converted to Christ. And when they encountered Jesus Christ, guess what they did? They gave up raping and pillaging. Nobody beat them with an army. They, 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 the Vikings were undefeated. And they gave it up when they came to faith in Jesus Christ. That's all I'm going to say about that for impact. Round seven, morality. Christianity takes the world's brokenness seriously. It doesn't whitewash it. It doesn't look around the world and say, oh, everything's fine. The, Christianity looks at the world and says, people are broken. And it takes my brokenness seriously. I'm messed up on the inside. I really want to be a good person, a kind person. I find myself being impatient. And I find myself acting in ways that I don't want to act. What is this failure within me where what I will to do, what I want to do, I fall short of my own standards, let alone, let alone God's perfect and beautiful standards. And the Bible says that that's sin, that dark, darkness is rebellion. Thor doesn't have an answer. You feel like you want to smash something? Have at thee, brother. <laughs> smash it. Christianity says, watch your action and, 
and guess what? Watch your words. And guess what? Watch the attitude in your heart. Because if you're all bent out of shape and you're in your mind, you're just cussing somebody, you just keep thinking ill thoughts of them, God says, you're falling short of my beautiful and perfect standard. I have, I have better things for you. I've called you to be a better person than that. Morality, Thor, he doesn't even... <laughs> I mean, do we, why, why are we even having this discussion? Well, because, well, one, in Wordsworth poem, uh, Longfellow's poem, uh, Thor issues a challenge, uh, because atheists today are saying, this book about Jesus Christ dying for your sins on the cross, that you can go to heaven, that you can be forgiven? Why believe in that? You might as well believe in, in Zeus or the Kraken or Thor. So we're saying, okay. We're going to challenge that. We're going to take a look at it. Is that true? Is that even remotely fair? Is that even a little bit intellectually honest? Or are we just playing games? Because I think we're playing games. Thor drinks hard and fights hard. Jesus Christ said, I'm going to lay down my life and suffer so that other people can know that God is good, that we can have a relationship together, we can, be, uh, we can enter into community together. A philosopher uh, from India, great philosopher named Ravi Zacharias, said something to the effect that one of the primary reasons he became a Christian was that the Bible explained his own heart to him better than any psychology or philosophy or sociology or political theory ever could. This Bible explained this war in his soul, this brokenness inside of him. Yeah, I've been fighting with God. And it's time to surrender. I just want to come clean and confess my sin. I just, I just want to have the freedom of saying, yeah, I'm not going to make excuses for my hard-headedness, my, my anger. I'm not going to make excuses for this anymore. I'm just going to say, God, you're right, and I'm wrong. And it feels so good to repent and say, God's ways are better than my ways. I look at Thor, what does he offer me on the moral front? Again, Christianity takes my brokenness seriously. There's an answer for what's going on in my soul. And people from every tribe, in every generation, every culture, have come to these and said, there's a savior here for me. Again! A bunch of shepherds, a bunch of fishermen on the edge of the Mediterranean wrote about a Savior that changes people's hearts generation after generation, culture after culture. Is this from God or is it just an amazing coincidence? Somehow they wrote something that captures our heart and resonates with us like unlike anything else. Which brings me to round eight, the story of Christ, the gospel. What is the gospel? It's this idea. Here's the truth. You and I, were broken. We have anger, bitterness, lust, greed. We have wicked things going on in our hearts. We, we, we often say and do things that are hurtful, even to the people we love most. We're not the people we aspire to be. We have fallen, by, the Bible says, far short of God's standard. And God could have just erased us. He could have walked away from us. He could have wound up the universe and say, I wash my hands, I'm done with these guys. Instead, God says, I love you so much. I'm going to come down from heaven. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give up all the rights I have to become like you, to live life alongside of you, to be beaten, mocked. Christ is still being mocked today to be spit upon, ultimately to lay down his life to pay for my messed up heart. And then with nail-scarred hands, because he hung on the cross for my sins, he says, come to me, Dan, I love you and I'm going to forgive you. And I say, I have no reason not to trust the Savior that would die for me. Lord, I hear you calling and I'm coming. This morning, if anybody hears the call of Jesus Christ, why fight such a good Savior? Just come to God. Come to Jesus. He loves you. And so we have this gospel narrative, this, this meta story. This is the archetypal love story. Have you ever thought of that? 
This is, the, this is the love story at the soul of all other love stories. It's been called the greatest story ever told. All other great stories are an echo of the gospel story. Think about, think about the love stories we know. There, there's there's a, a woman, and, and she's just not that interested in a man, and that shows human race. We're not that interested in God. We just don't have time for God, and they kind of turn their back to him. But the reader knows, oh, why, why are you turning your back on this guy? He, he's a pretty good guy. <laughs> he loves you. Life, your life is, would be so much better with him. And so in this love story, the, the woman turns her back to the man, and he pursues, and she rejects him. And he doesn't give up because his love is strong. And, and then he starts to suffer because of it. And people mock at him and ridicule him. Ultimately, it looks like against all odds, death comes down, he's going to be hammered. The end of the love story, right? But what happens in a good love story? When it looks like there's no hope, up he rises from the ashes. He say, he, and he rises in victory. He reaches over. Now she looks at him because of all he's done for her. And she sees him for the first time. And she says, wow, you really do love me. You really do care. And she comes to him. He, he says, come here, honey. I'm going to take you away from this. You weren't made for this. You're actually a princess. And he brings her on his white horse, and he's victorious. And he says, I'm going to take you away to happily ever after. And that's what Jesus Christ did. He came down into our world. He, he suffered on the cross. He died and says, come with me. And he will be the bride. He will be the bridegroom and we will be the bride. And Christ, the relationship with Christ is so intimate, it's like marriage. He says, come with me. You are made for a better world and I'm going to give you a better place. So, man, those, those clever shepherds, those clever fishermen, somehow they tapped into the central story of the human race. So that all other stories are an echo of this one. Good versus evil, it's all right there. And that story uh, resonates with people in generation after generation, country after country. Thor doesn't have a meta narrative. Nothing else like it. Again, either a secular miracle or something mysterious and supernatural is going on here. Christianity is about relationship and God calling us to faith in Him. All right. Round nine, winner take all, knockout round. Maybe this is not a big deal to you. Round nine, apparently uh, Richard Dawkins, uh, Bill Marg, those kind of guys, they, this is not a big deal. Uh, but maybe some other people will think it's, uh, this is a minor point, but we should ask maybe, was either one of them real? <laughs> now, I, I think that's a good question, but apparently uh, not everybody does. Is there any reason to believe that either Thor or Christ were real historical figures Needless to say, uh, or maybe surprisingly, Thor is lacking on this front. Uh, Christ changed the world. The men who claimed to know him personally and saw him die were willing to die to tell others that he rose from the grave. Now, listen to this. A lot of people are willing to die. People have died because they believe in communism. People have died because they believe in Islam. It, it's possible to die for something you really believe in. But why would they die if they knew it was a lie that Jesus rose from the grave? See, other people, if they believed it, they, who weren't first-hand witnesses, that would kind of make sense. But the first-hand witnesses went everywhere telling Jesus, he's real. He died and he rose again and you can, you can live too. And they were so confident about this message that they faced death. Many of them died to share the message of Jesus Christ. If they knew it was a lie, why would they have done that? The first books about Jesus, again, appeared shortly after his time. Galatians, written by Paul, was probably written in 47 to 49 A.D. Remember, Jesus died somewhere around 30, 32 uh, A.D. Jesus is mentioned not only by New Testament writers, but by Jewish writers and Roman writers as well. Thus, uh, there's this guy, uh, his name is uh, Bart Ehrman. I don't recommend his books. He's an anti-Christian New Testament scholar. Bart Ehrman, who doesn't believe in Jesus and doesn't want you to believe in Jesus either, has this to say. 
you need to consider historical evidence. And to say that historical evidence doesn't count, I mean, why don't you just deny the Holocaust? Why not deny that Abraham Lincoln existed? You have to look at the evidence, and there is very hard evidence that Jesus Christ was a real historical figure. Uh, this was a nine-round fight. Jesus took Thor's challenge. Jesus wins all nine rounds, a devastating victory, clear, decisive victory. And this should now be obvious. Even if you decide not to believe in Jesus Christ, it's intellectually dishonest to equate faith in Christ to faith in Thor or the flying spaghetti monster. The message of Christ is either amazing because it's from God or it's an amazing secular miracle because it defies all odds. I have a deep faith in Jesus Christ. He's my Lord. He's my Savior. He's forgiven me of my sins. He's given me a better life. He's given me hope and meaning. He's taught me to, he's taught me to and I'm still a work in progress, but he's teaching me how to really care and to love He's given me hope. He's promised me, the one who rose from the dead has promised me eternal life. And I have no reason to doubt him. But you don't have to take my word for it. It's my hope that you will take seriously the claims of Jesus Christ. And that you'll commit yourself, please commit yourself to a fair and honest investigation of the person of Christ. And I want to remind you that the stakes are high. Because if this is true, it changes everything. And there is a purpose, and there's a meaning. There's a God who cares. He's opened wide heaven's doors. And nothing's keeping you from heaven except the decision in your own heart. You can come towards the Lord, or you can choose to walk away from the Lord. Everybody's been given this choice. God's a gentleman. He doesn't force us to love him. So we need to ask ourselves, do I love God? Have I ever said thank you for the cross? He's reaching out to me. Have I grabbed a hold of that hand in faith? In 1 John 14, 6, Jesus tells us, he says, I am the way. I'm the truth and the life. You know, there's philosophers in history, they'll tell you, they'll say philosophers like Siddhartha Gautama or Confucius, they'll say, I'll teach you about the way of life, uh, the way to live. I'll teach you about truth. I'll teach you about life. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And a few chapters earlier, Christ asked this question, this big question. Christ asked this question, and it still echoes today. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies, and anyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this, is what Christ has said. And so we need to answer his question. Do I believe? All right, we're going to have a, a post, postlude, an ending to wrap up our story. Thor versus Jesus. In 732, <coughs> excuse me, in 723 AD, there was a Celtic Christian. He was an Anglo-Saxon. Anglo-Saxon, there was these... Two Germanic tribes, one was the Angles, one was the Saxons, they mixed together. He was an Anglo-Saxon missionary from the kingdom of Wessex, which is, uh, and he came to the heart of uh, modern Germany, and he took a stand against the worship of Thor. And that was, at that time, most of the missionaries were coming from England, in, the, in Ireland, this Celtic brand of Christianity, and they were coming to the main continent to bring Jesus Christ. And he goes right into the center of Germany, who later becomes Germany, and he takes a stand against Thor, and his name was Winfrith, which is just a beautiful name. And, and Winfrith was uh, commissioned by Martel the Hammer. Remember Martel the Hammer? He was the one who at the Battle of Tours, he gathered all these Germanic tribes together, and the Muslim armies had, had swept from Arabia and, and taken Egypt, and, which was a Roman province, and swept across North Africa, and they had come into to Europe, and they took over Spain, and Europe was about to become Muslim. And at the Battle of Tours, Martel the Hammer smashes the Muslim armies and, and keeps Europe from becoming Islamic. And Martel the Hammer commissions Winfrith to, to kind of, his back flank is all these 
Thor worshiping uh, uh, pagan uh, Germanic tribes. He says, you've got to take the gospel to them. So in front of many German warriors, and that would be scary. These are pagan warriors. They're buff. Their job is to kill people. In front of many pagan warriors, he comes to this sacred oak tree. It's this big old oak tree dedicated to the worship of Thor. It's a shrine. And he takes off his shirt, and he takes out an axe. And all these Germans are watching. He takes the axe to the, he knocks down the oak tree. And they wait, and nothing happens. And the god of thunder doesn't strike him with lightning. In that day, many uh, Germanic warriors were baptized into Christ. And then he took the wood, and he built a church out of it. For the rest of his life, he tirelessly spread the gospel in Central Europe until about 30 years later he was set upon and killed by pagans in a forest in Phrygia at the Mord Wood or Murder Wood. Many others followed him from England, including Elquin, uh, who served in the court of King Charlemagne, and that's where my son Aaron takes his middle name from. The writer of, of The Hobbit is big right now. The writer of The Lord of the Rings, J.R.R. Tolkien, considered the Anglo-Saxon missions in Europe to be one of the chief glories of England, that they brought the gospel out of England to the European continent. I would like to close now by reading a prayer by the missionary Winfrith, later known as St. Boniface. Uh, remember, he's the man who struck a mighty victory against the worship of Thor. Please bow your heads and pray with me. Eternal God, the refuge and help of all your children, we praise you for all that you have given us, for all you have done for us, for all that you are to us. In our weakness, you are strength. In our darkness, you are light. In our sorrow, you are comfort and peace. We cannot number your blessings. We cannot declare your love. For all your blessings, we bless you. May we live as in your presence and love the things that you love and serve you in our daily lives through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Wasn't that nice to pray with Brother Winfrith this morning? Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Jamesville Athletic Club.